morning, church. Uh, good morning and welcome to our neighbors. I'm glad to be with you this morning. And um, yeah, I, I spend probably too much time thinking about the nature of our world and the nature of life. Um, and I say probably too much, not because you, maybe you can't think about those things too much, but I feel like I end up dwelling on it to the degree where I have significantly more questions than I have answers. I have a lot more observations than I have solutions. Um, and I think that's because life is dynamic. Life is always changing. Um, I, I had an experience this week where uh, I was in a, a room full of pastors, and it's crazy how quickly COVID hit just has become a code name for everything that we experienced starting in 2020 and, and how everything, it seems like, most things in the world changed and most things in the world became different. COVID hit. Okay, so whatever categories we were operating in before, we no longer are operating in, um, and it's dynamic. And I, and I had the experience this week um, that I don't think I've ever, I can ever remember having. Somebody said COVID hit, and everybody just kind of nodded their head. And I looked around the circle, and I thought, what's the, the next COVID? Because I don't think anybody in that room was anticipating what we walked into. Um, and there is no guarantee that there is not some other pandemic on the horizon. And I don't, I don't fear monger. Like I'm not, I'm not interested in getting you anxious about it. But I, I want um, to impress on you that we are frail and very much out of control of the world that we live in. Life is dynamic. It's constantly changing. And as soon as, at least for me, as soon as I feel like I have created a solution, uh, there comes a problem that can overcome my solution. <laughs> Like every time I like I feel sometimes like I'm running around in front of that uh, in front of that um, that dike, and, and sticking uh, fingers in the hole of the water that's coming through. Um, life is dynamic, and sometimes our solutions just aren't. Um, I heard somebody describe how the world is changing in this way. They said life has always been complicated. Life has always been complicated in that there are um, different, different things that need to go in a certain order. There's a, there's a complication to life. But with the advent of the internet age and, and the information being able to be shared so quickly and suddenly we are all tied together in this very strange way, life is no longer complicated. Now it is complex. We pull one string and this other thing over here starts to come apart. Um, so now that we're all thoroughly discouraged, I'd like to bring our attention to the Word of God. <laughs> there are some solutions, um, and yet as we, as we come to God and as we begin to uh, try and unravel our lives before Him, um, He's going to bring us back to some very simple principles um, that as we begin to really digest how they work together, come to realize that following Jesus is more than just a, a one, two, three step um, is more than simple addition. So um, let's pray together. And I need it. I suspect that perhaps you do. And maybe we get a clicker this morning. That'd be great. Awesome. Let's pray together. Um, it's our, our habit to pray the disciples' prayer at, at this time. So I'd invite you to bow your, your hearts and pray with me. You can pray with your lips as well if you'd like to. The words are there on the screen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. If you would, please turn with me to 1 John, and we're going to begin in chapter 2 this morning. 1 John chapter 2 uh, is page 1267 in the blue Bibles that are probably tucked in the chair in front of you. 1267, 1 John chapter 2. We're in a series that we've called Light in the Dark, and <clears throat> the whole letter of 1 John is unpacking a very simple phrase uh, we, saw it yet, we saw it last week in chapter 1, verse 5. This is the message that we've heard from him and proclaimed to you, that God is light, 
and in him is no darkness at all. And we spent some time unpacking uh, a little bit of what that means last week, um, maybe too much time, um, if the length of the sermon's any indication. But we're not done yet. We're going to continue to unpack that, uh, unpack that very simple phrase, that very simple sentence that has huge implications. Um, and I'm going to begin in chapter 2. I'm going to begin in verse 1. We read these verses and looked at them a, a little bit last week, um, but they're so important. They're such a hinge. I want to make sure that we hit them again. So 1 John chapter 2, uh, beginning in verse 1. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And by this we know that we have come to know him, if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him truly, the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. We'll pause there together. I'd just like to remind you as we're going through this letter um, that this was written by one of Jesus' closest friends. Um, One of his closest uh, companions traveled with him, um, experienced firsthand the grief and the sorrow of of observing the crucifixion, experienced firsthand the joy of seeing Jesus resurrected, um, and even makes a note in his biography about Jesus that he ran faster than all the other disciples to, to to, to find this out. Um, so, but he's an old guy now, and, and the picture that helps me read John is, is uh, an old guy sitting in the rocking chair on the front porch. So he says a couple of things, and they come at you sideways, and you're like, man, what, where, does he, where does he get off saying that? But just, just imagine, he's a guy who's seen a lot, um, who has a lot of experiences, and who doesn't have time for your nonsense. He's just going to say it like he's going to say it, and it is where it is, and you'll figure out that he was right about 10 years down the road, um, and I feel like it's taking me about 10 years to chew on, on what he's saying here, but, but, but I, kinda, I call him lovingly Crazy Uncle John, um, sitting in the rocking chair, and, and you hear that there in this opening, that phone never rings, like even when I'm here all week long, that phone never rings, so I don't know what's going on back there. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't answer. It's fine. It, there's a voicemail there. Um, you hear that tone of crazy Uncle John there in, in, in verse 1. My little children. This isn't, this isn't, um, he's not like trying to gaslight us. Like he legit, I think this is legitimately how he feels about the people that he's communicating to. My little children, I love you. Like I, I, I am a spiritual father to you. I really want you to grasp this. I've got some hard things to say to you, but I say them to you in love. He says, my little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And, and notice, he says, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. I don't want you to sin. Sin is not a good pattern for your living. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate. So he goes goes from you and and if you sin to we have an advocate. So it's not just like, I'm crazy Uncle John, I, I haven't sinned in 50 years, and so let me tell you how to live your life. He's saying, I don't want you to sin. That's not the right pattern for your life. But if you sin, glory, hallelujah, we have a Savior. I need him too. He's walking with me now also. He is the propitiation for our sins. He he is the one, his sacrifice solves the problem of our sin. And not for ours only, not for those of us who showed up to a church service on Sunday morning, not just for those of us who are getting our act together or want to say that we're walking with Jesus, but for the whole world also. For people who not only would say, would say that they don't have a walk with Jesus, would say, I never want to have a walk with Jesus. I hate him. Jesus' love was so great that his his, uh, sacrifice is extended, his invitation is extended to people that that want nothing to do with him. So there's a little bit of a formula here, and this is the formula that I grew up with, and I thought that all of life worked like this. The thing that matters is where you fall on the scale of unbelief or belief. The thing that matters is that where you fall... um, on the scale of unbelief or belief. Do you believe 
that Jesus is the Son of God, that he is uh, here to save your sins. If you believe that, if you fall um, to the uh, right side of that line, if you believe that, then life's going to be great. Everything's going to go your way. Like, God's going to bless you. Your hair will grow back. You'll always have money in your savings account. Like, life's going to be good. All you need is belief, a quality of belief that reflects the quality of the good news. That was, that was, the, um, that was the, the uh, system that I grew up kind of buying into. And that is true. That's the foundation of what we're talking about here. John's saying... I don't want you to sin, but if you sin, like know that the invitation for your sin to be forgiven is open. That you can cross that line to belief in Jesus and that 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 redemption is applied to you. The invitation is free. But life's a little bit more dynamic than that. He says in verse 3, And by this we know that we have come to know him. How do you know that you believe the right thing? By this you know we've come to know him. If we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, truly the love of God is perfected. By this we know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. So so John's John's not pulling any punches. He said in chapter 1, he says, if you say this thing about yourself, but then you walk a different way, you're a hypocrite and you are lying. He said, he, called, he said that you are lying, which is true. Here, he brings it home a little bit more. He says, if, if, you, um, if you say, I know him, if you say, I know God, but you don't keep his commandments, you are a liar. It's not that you're lying, it's that you are a liar. It's characteristic of, of who you are, and the truth is not in him. Um, and so what's the, what's the dynamic here? It's not belief and unbelief. It's disobedience and obedience. And then the category, and so then you can believe the right thing, but be disobedient and fall outside the square of redemption, (laughs) right? Or you can do the right things without the foundation of belief in Jesus as a savior and fall outside the square of redemption, right? So you can can, uh, can, uh, wear a suit and tie Sunday morning, every Sunday, you can be there every day. You can be nice to your kids all week long. You can provide for your family. You can be a good person. And without that dynamic of belief or unbelief, fall outside of Jesus' grace. There's a lot of good people that voted the right way that aren't trusting Jesus. And they don't know that they need him for their life. It's real easy sometimes to look at, at somebody who, who is very different from us and go, wow, you need Jesus. It's really hard to have a conversation with somebody that believe, that lines up with you politically or sociologically or whatever and to look at them and go, I don't think you're following, like, you need Jesus too. And they're looking at you going, we're the same. And you're like, no, there's, there's something inherently different about what's going on with us. Um. Whoever says, I know him, but doesn't obey him, is a liar. Here we go. All right. We must (laughs) just just unplug the phone. (laughs) We'll get to it later. Um, Whoever says, I know him, but doesn't obey him, is a liar. And and here is something, a, a, a simple principle that has helped me to navigate family relationships and has helped me to navigate relationship with God. Familiarity is not the same thing as intimacy. Familiarity is not the same thing as intimacy. Familiarity is, I know, I know what gets on your nerves. I know exactly how to push your buttons. It's, it's, I know what's going on with you. I know how you think. I know if I say this, that's how you're going to respond. I'm familiar with you. I know things about you. But that is different from intimacy. Intimacy is we are sharing life together. One, one, you can be really, you can know how a person is going to react and you can manipulate them. But to have intimacy with the person is, is a different level of, of, of life. It's, it's reordering life. And so there are people who are familiar with God that have a fact sheet or have a doctrinal exam that they can pass of facts in black and white and yet their life doesn't match up with what they're preaching. It doesn't look like it. I think it's really significant, verse 6, that um, has been challenging to me um, 
in my walk. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. If our doctrine pursues, or if, our, if the outpouring of our doctrine is a lifestyle that doesn't look like Jesus walked, then we've gone wrong somewhere, either in the understanding or in the application. Familiarity doesn't equal intimacy. So, what are we saying about our connection with God? Like, what do we say? That's, that's, John's, that's John's focus here. He says, anybody who says this but does the other thing, anybody who says that but does this thing, what is it that people say? What is it that we are saying about our connection with God? <clears throat> um, I suspect that perhaps that question is easier to answer on a Sunday morning. <laughs> um, what about Thursday afternoon? What do we say? What are we claiming about our connection with God? And how would crazy Uncle John interact with that? If he just calls him like he sees him, what would, what would he say about us? What are we saying about our connection with God? What's coming out of our mouth? I run into a lot of people that as I talk with them or ask questions about their faith, they're real quick to tell me what church they belong to. <clears throat> Familiarity is not intimacy. Knowing the right answers is not walking with Jesus. What are we saying and are we liars? I say that we on purpose. I ask myself the same question. Our big idea for the morning is we know God as we wholly practice what he said. We know God as we wholly practice what he said. Whoever says he abides in him, whoever says he has Jesus' life in him, ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. <clears throat> life is a little bit more dynamic. <clears throat> but believe it or not, it gets a little bit more dynamic than we've already looked at. So let's continue reading in verse 7. Beloved, again, not from a heart of condemnation, but the heart of, of love and family. Beloved, I am writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I am writing to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. So we get a little bit of clarity about how, um, how John is, is, is thinking about this. He's not just making general blanket statements. He's talking to people who have faith in Jesus, who've started their walk with Jesus. Um, because he, he says with confidence, um, I'm, what I'm writing you is true in him, it's true in Jesus and in you because the darkness is already passing away, is already passing away, that's already in process. These dark parts of our heart that we like to keep to ourselves, God is already shining his light into. We're already in process of growing in him. Um, but he wants to make sure that we do that in, in a way that's clear. And what is the next layer of, of, of dynamic growth? Is love. So we went from a two-dimensional graph to a three-dimensional graph. Uh, there's a third dimension, and it's not easy to, to picture, so I, I, I shifted our graph around a little bit so that we've got quadrants instead. So you've got the dynamic of belief and unbelief, which is necessary. You've got the dynamic of obedience and disobedience, and then you've got the dynamic of love and hate, and then instead of having a quarter, we have an eighth square of redemption, where obedient or belief followed by obedience practiced in love becomes the path of redemption. And the opposite of that or the contrast of that would be unbelief, walking in disobedience to what God has said with hate in your heart towards your brother. I'm trying to take 
John's really compelling story and put it down into sim as simple words as I can and, and, and articulate this. Um, I actually can't take credit for, for how this, um, there's a, a guy who wrote a commentary, his, name's, his last name's Yarbrough, and he's the first one that kind of showed me this. But it's an interesting dynamic, uh, a dynamic expression of, of, of truths that I did not grasp um, as a young kid. I thought, okay, we just have, do you believe in Jesus? Yes, you're good. The rest of this stuff doesn't matter. And then there's those people that are like, no, you got to follow. you got to follow Jesus. you got to do the right things and believe the right things. And, and okay, I understand that. Um, but there's something that goes wrong there too. If we do the right things and we believe the right things, but we are hateful towards everybody else that we run into, then something's gone wrong too. There's, all of these things are worked out in love. 1 Corinthians 13 is a passage that's often read in weddings. Um, the context, excuse me, the context of a perfect love is expressed within a congregation. <clears throat> love is patient, love is kind, love does not envy, does not boast, it keeps no record of wrongs. And if we were a church like that, I don't think anybody would have any question about the person that we believe as being true. <clears throat> He says a couple of things uh, about this. He says, I'm writing to you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. What do you mean love is an old commandment that we had from the beginning? Like, I've looked at the Old Testament, and God's pretty angry back there. Like, he seems like he needs um, some medication for his anger issues. Like, he destroys whole people and things like that. Um, what do you mean this is an old commandment? Um, there's something tucked away back here that's going to sound familiar to you. And I'm going to turn there if you'll allow me, and you can too. I'm, I'm going to Leviticus chapter 19. <clears throat> and the, chapter 19 starts like this. This is the old law. This is thousands of years before Jesus walked the earth. This is God setting up a covenant people, and he's giving them some rules to, to, to operate by. So this is like, if we grew up in church, or if you grew up in the kind of church I grew up in, like this is, this is good Bible preaching right here. You know what I'm saying? And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to all the congregation of the people of Israel and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Okay, like that's, that's what I think of when I think about going to church. Like you got to be holy. You got to get your life together. You got to get yourself cleaned up. And, and then we have a whole list of like, don't drink, don't chew, don't date girls that do. You know, we've got this whole list of things that we think that those are the things that are going to make us holy. But the rest of chapter 19 actually lays out what holiness looks like on the ground, what it looks like in the tent, what it looks like on the street. And down here, a really surprising, if you've never seen it before, a really surprising verse in chapter 19, verse 17. You shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance. Or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am Yahweh. I am the Lord. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Where Have we heard that somewhere before? Didn't somebody else make that quote famous? Because I know I haven't read Levit Leviticus well enough to remember this, right? Where, did that, where have we heard that before? Holler at me. Matthew? Who was saying it? Jesus. Jesus gets all the credit for saying love your neighbor as yourself, but it was Yahweh in the Old Testament who told us to do it first. It's not a new commandment. There's, there's an exercise, there's a practice of God's instruction, which we can do, and we can do in a self-righteous way that condemns other people. And yet that wasn't the heart of God, even from the beginning. Walking in God's commandments was always meant to be done in love towards your neighbors from the get-go. We just missed it the first time around. And Jesus came, we're actually going to spend a lot of time in uh, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount over the next 18 months. <clears throat> but as Jesus comes, he says, you heard it said, and like the words were true, but you applied them the wrong way. You heard it said, but I'm telling you, the heart of the matter was this. You didn't go deep enough. It wasn't enough for you to just do the right thing, but you needed to also exercise it in love. So, beloved, beloved, hear me. Hear my heart. I'm writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I'm writing to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. So how is it new? If it's old, 
How is it new? It's new in that I got to love my brother this week. I got to make decisions about how I'm going to talk to people. I got to rein in my emotions. Even this morning, my tiredness is not an excuse for being demeaning and condescending to people. It's an old commandment, but boy, it's fresh. It cuts today. It's on the ground right now. Whoever says he's in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Not complete and utter darkness because the true light is already shining, but, but there's a darkness in your heart where you've missed the force of what Jesus was trying to command us, was trying to teach us. And there's no, co- or whoever loves his brother abides in the light. In him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. So I want, I want us to see the cube. I want us to see the three dimensions of this as John's articulating because a lot of times we like to treat the Bible like a fortune cookie. Um, excuse me. And less like a fortune cookie and more like somebody, some sadistic person who broke open all the fortunes and just put all the paper in a, in, a, in a barrel, and then they ate all the cookies. So we don't get any of the joy out of it. We just get the commandments, right? And so sometimes we'll just shove our arm in the barrel and pull, pull a little fortune out and read a Bible verse and be like, oh, I guess i got to figure out how to do this today. And that can be really overwhelming, particularly if you pull out the verse, whoever loves his brother abides in the light. And in him there's no cause for stumbling because there's a lot of people who are going to approach this and be like, if you don't love people, then what you're doing doesn't matter. And so love is the only thing that matters. And so if you ever do anything that makes somebody uncomfortable, that wasn't very loving, and so you're doing the wrong thing. And they've completely missed that there are actually three dimensions to this. I grew up in a church that came from the other direction. We said, if you believe the right thing, then you're on the right path. People have come to this from the other direction and say, if you only love, then you're on the right path. And and we missed the whole picture of its belief and obedience exercised in love. You can't can't take one line out of John and and build your whole life on it. He, he, He says a lot of things. I tried to picture this week if, uh, if everything that I ever said was written down in a book. How would I feel about people just taking one sentence and, and, and trying to build their lives off of that? Like, that's hard for me to imagine. But we do it to Scripture all the time. We're quick to jump in on a verse and miss the whole of the thing. <clears throat> and what's the whole of the thing? Have we been saved... Or are we being saved? Have we been saved or are we being saved? When somebody asks you about your faith, what comes to mind? Is it something that happened 10 years ago? Is our faith built in the past of what is accomplished, what has been believed, or what has been obeyed? Is it a time where we were on the right track that we say, that's what my faith is based off of? Have we been saved? There's, there's a whole bunch of people in Marion County, you ask them, they go, oh yeah, I'm saved. I'm saved. I walked the aisle when I was 13 years old. I got it written in my big old Bible that's got six layers of dust on it. I'm saved. Don't you tell me I ain't saved because I got it written down. I understand. I understand. But the invitation of Jesus is to follow Have we been saved or are we being saved? What does that look like this morning? What does that look like this past week? I had a conversation with a guy um, and I had the relationship to be able to to have this conversation where he was saying, he was asking me my advice about how to whatever. I said, well, are you a Christian? He says, well, yeah, I'm a Christian. I said, I don't believe you. He said, what do you mean you don't believe you? I said, I've heard you talk. I've heard you talk a lot. You say a whole lot of things. You talk about all your plans. You talk about all the things you want to do. And I get it. Like, you're, you're a young guy. Um, like, you're, you're, you're trying to figure life out. I understand. But I never hear you ask how Jesus would impact the things that you're planning to do. If you, if you, if you make all of your plans in life and Jesus isn't even a factor of consideration, then how can we say that we're following him? 
have we been saved or are we being saved? We know God as we wholly practice what he has said. I'm not, I'm not real comfortable with that big idea. I don't think it's worded very well. Um, but it's the best I could do this week. <laughs> I'm hoping that by all of the other things that I'm saying, you, you hear the meaning behind it. We know God as we wholly practice what he has said. There's a verse in, in Jeremiah chapter 9, verses 23 and 24. And it's, it's, if, if I'm going to take any verse out of context and use it, it's probably going to be that one. <clears throat> because the context around it is real dirty. It's a lot of condemnation. It's a lot of God pouring out judgment on people who rightly deserved it. But in Jeremiah 9, 23 and, and 24, he says, Let not the one who's wise boast in his wisdom, but not the one who's strong boast in his strength. Let not the one who's wealthy boast in his money, but let the one who boasts boast in this, that he knows me, that I am the Lord, I am Yahweh, God of compassion, holy and righteous. And it was always founded on God's character. We read in, in, in Leviticus 19, he closes that love, love your neighbor as yourself with, I am Yahweh. You will reflect my character when you walk in this way. Let's close with a little poem. How's that? <clears throat> Verse 12. I'm writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I'm writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. This is a weird Weird section here. If, if you're looking at the same translation, it's offset a little bit. I've seen some other translations that just make it normal paragraphs. But this kind of is like a poem in the middle. Like Crazy Uncle John just remembered an old song he used to like a lot, and he starts singing in the middle of his story. <clears throat> it's kind of strange. And, and I struggled with how to take it apart. So let me give you a couple observations that will help us hang, hang um, what we're talking about here. Uh, there's three categories of people that he's talking about. He talks about uh, little children or children. He writes about fathers and he writes about young men. You've got different generations here. And, and uh, let's not get hung up on the fact that they're all uh, masculine. Um, he's including women too. It's just the feature of how they used to talk in Greek. It's a feature of the language, not a feature of the patriarchy. Anyway, I don't want to get into it. Women, he's talking to you too. <laughs> And he says, little children, people who are just walking, who are just learning how to walk, who are just learning their ABCs, that are trying to grasp and, 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 and get to walk with God. Um, he says, to you, I have this message. To fathers, those who not only have walked this walk, but have taught others how to walk, then I have this exhortation for you. And for, for young men, for young people, that you're learning how to walk the walk and you're walking it confidently, but you've not yet been tested with the ability to pass it on to another person then I write these things to you. We've got three generations here in view. The other observation is the first three sections here, he says, I am writing. The writing is ongoing. And then the last three, he says, I write to you or I have written to you. And so I make those observations, but I don't, I don't know what the meaning is. I don't know why it's significant. I just see that he did that. And I'm not, I'm, I need to spend more time in it. But I, but I see those things. But what I see is that we've got, uh, we've got a, a holistic address to the people in the congregation. And for the little children, he says, your sins are forgiven for his namesake. Your sins are forgiven. But it wasn't because you were a good person. It's for his namesake, for his glory. Your sins are forgiven. And then I write to you because you know the Father. Little children, you need to know this. You can know God. You can't know everything about him. His, your knowledge of him will not be exhaustive. You'll never nail him down and be able to perfectly describe him, but you can know him intimately. 
and your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. To the fathers, he says the same thing twice. You know him who is from the beginning. You know him who is from the beginning. Like, you're figuring out this dynamic of walking in obedience. And I think that belief and obedience are there, but I wonder if this isn't a sideways encourage to add that third dynamic of love. Be a father. Love the people you lead. To the young man, he's got a lot to say, and I get it because young guys are stupid. <clears throat> I'm writing to you because you've overcome the evil one. You're, you're fighting. You're in, the, you're, you're in the trenches. You're making it work, and you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, young men, because you are strong. Like you're, you're doing the right thing. The word of God abides in you. You're figuring out how to, how to apply the word of God to your life, and you have overcome the evil one. There's a dynamic where the evil one's overcome by the revealed word of God perfectly in Jesus' character and his example, but also in the things that he wrote. Also perfect. How do we, how do we interact with this? He addresses everybody in the congregation, and he does so without judgment for where we're at. We're not all at the same stage of development, and that is okay. In fact, that's by design. We should all be in different places. We should all need to grow more. And we should not feel guilty for being where we are. Growing complacent and being happy with where I am and I never want to grow again is a different story. But we don't feel guilty because we are where we're at. Forgiveness, the foundation here I see is forgiveness. It's always free. It's based on the work of Jesus. We can be reconciled to God and have fellowship with God and have fellowship with one another because of the work that Jesus has done. We put Jesus first. He alone has set us free. That forgiveness and that fellowship, that fellowship is perfected by the word. You see his exhortation to young men, keep diving in, keep fighting from the word. But that vertical relationship, that strength and strong relationship with God is practiced horizontally. I, w- I wish I could give you like three bullet points and it'd be good, but I, I drew you a three-dimensional <laughs> diagram and I'm not even sure that that completely articulates the whole dynamic of what it's like to follow Jesus and what it's like to do it well. When I look at that, when I see, when I see the expectations, I go, oh, oh dear Lord, I need you. <laughs> I'm so far off of that. I've got love for this person, but man, I'm not encouraging them to walk right. Or I know exactly the right thing to do, but I'm not sure I believe that it's the right, or I'm not sure that I believe that you're going to do it because you're redeeming all of creation. There's so many ways that I can go wrong in myself. And the only encouragement I have is to fix your eyes on Jesus and ask if we will trust Jesus for our next stage of growth. Sometimes we walk up to it and we know exactly what we're walking into. And sometimes we're about halfway through before we realize, oh, he's, he's teaching me something in here. <laughs> but will we trust Jesus for our next stage of growth? Because we know God as we wholly practice what he has said. Would you pray with me? God, we do need you. Um, you knew that before we figured it out. And thanks for telling us. God, these, these, these words are so rich. And God, you know the pages and notes that, that didn't make it to this time together. So Lord, I trust that um, you are speaking through your word. And God, I pray that anything I said that's just my opinion, that those things would be quickly forgotten. But God, that your word would stand true, would shape our hearts and shape our lives. I pray that you'd strengthen us that you fill us with the faith to believe you well, faith to follow you in obedience, and faith to love those that you have put in our lives, those that we might call our enemies. God, would you help us to love them well? 
that we might know that we know you. Would you grow your heart in us? It's in your name we pray. Amen. So this conversation isn't designed to be the end of the matter. In fact, it's just the beginning. It's the start of a conversation. And so here's the questions that we talked about. Um, We could spend some time chewing on them. Maybe these are things you take uh, out of here and get get, get around a table with some friends and say, hey, what do you think about this? This is, I'm struggling with how to figure out how to put this. Um, But this is the start of a conversation, and at the start of it, I'd really like to uh, invite God into the process. So let's take a few minutes and and spend some time talking to him about these questions, but about what he's brought to mind in our time together, and then we'll close together singing.